Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. This episode is brought to you by Coifin. Coifin displays financial information simply and elegantly. Coifin is one of the fastest growing platforms for financial data and analytics to research stocks and understand market trends. I discovered them thanks to their very passionate users, many of which are my friends. Imagine a Bloomberg Lite with tons of high quality fundamental data, a powerful graph engine that can show it all clearly, and a user interface that doesn't look like it was built in the 1990s. If you're an individual investor, research analyst, portfolio manager, or financial advisor, do yourself a favor and check them out. You won't regret it. Sign up for free at koifin.com. That's K-O-Y-F-I-N.com. And just in case you didn't hear that enough, Koifin. Also, if you're listening to me, check out Koifin. It means a lot to me to deliver something for the sponsor of the show. I like Rob. I think I probably like you, the listener. You seem to like me if you're tuning in. You might like Rob. Everybody should get together and do stuff together. Check them out. That's K-O-Y-F-I-N dot com. Koifin. All right. Now, this episode features Chris Bloomstrand. Chris is perhaps best known for his annual letter, although his Twitter threads are increasingly getting him more known. I met him at a Manual of Ideas event and found him to be a very fun guy to hang out with. He may come across as quite serious when you hear him chat in an interview, but I can assure you that he's got a very non-serious side and he's super thoughtful. I find him to be a deeply principled thinker. Some investors may think that value has had its day in the sun and Value investors in general are a thing of the past and destined to underperform. What I will tell you is I think that Chris understands those arguments, has internalized those arguments, and disagrees with those arguments. You can uh, think for yourself as to whether or not you agree or disagree with Chris. But what I don't think that anybody can say is that Chris hasn't thought deeply about his positions, why he thinks the way he thinks, and I admire the way that he tries to sound the alarm in areas that he sees some risk in. So I hope that you all enjoy the episode. I have enjoyed getting to know Chris. I enjoyed recording this episode. I hope I left off where some of the great podcasts that he's done, like Invest Like the Best and The Fort left off. I hope that I can add to this discussion. And as always, none of this is financial advice. All the information contained in this program is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your financial advisor before making investment decisions and do your own due diligence. Uh, So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. Thrilled to be joined with my man, Chris Bloomstrand. It's been far too long since we've talked. Uh, I wish that we were enjoying a nice glass of red wine together, as we sometimes do. But soon enough... Soon enough. So, Chris, how you doing today? Bill, I'm well. I'm well. Um, I'm off a recent bout with the COVID, which uh, was kind of unexpected and took a little more of a toll than I had hoped, but uh, wound up doing Regeneron's monoclonal antibody therapy, which is badass stuff, and knocked it out in a couple, three days, and kind of, kind of 99% back. I lost a little bit of my smell and taste, which, you know, talking about drinking wine, um, you know, I'm kind of knocking wood and hoping this thing, uh, r- reverts to hundred percent. I'm one of those onophile snobby guys that can stick his nose in a glass and come up with a decent idea of where it's from. And, you know, even occasionally, um, you know, kind of nail down, you know, whether it's new, old, sometimes the actual year, sometimes the actual vineyard. So to, to, to lose that ability and lose the, uh, you know, the smell and the taste of good food. I mentioned in that the message we traded that you know I'd have to think about Aubrey McClending it if uh, <laughs> if I didn't recover. So obviously kidding on that front, kid. Yeah, Still, no, I, I uh, thought it was a a funny don't. thing to receive from you, given how much uh, I know that you know about wine. And I will say, <laughs> if anyone is fortunate enough to enjoy wine with you, uh, one of the benefits of your almost encyclopedic knowledge of wine is you know the best value wines on the menu as well. And I have never been disappointed with the price or the wine that we've ordered together. And it's a, it's a nice benefit because I'm usually just at the sommelier's, uh, 
whatever they recommend and i'm i'm usually overpaying relative to what i think i should be paying yeah being a value guy tr definitely translates into consumption habits and so you know i've learned over the years if you're at a big steakhouse don't don't go to napa california you've, you know you tend to find bargains in italy and in spain so a nice rioja you know, a lot of times you can find wines that are a little off the beaten path that are outstanding that you know wouldn't retail for a lot and you know the the big california cabs tend to get marked way up at most places because that's what most are familiar with and so if you're a little more familiar with some of the other worldly stuff you can find some value and you know if you look at my basement i i wouldn't call it a wine cellar i've got a wine basement with too much wine um you know, I, I do not drink at a high price point. I've got some special bottles. I set a few bottles down for each of my kids uh, to give them. I thought originally when they were 21, the, the wines were from the year of uh, harvest, um, but decided they're going to get them when they're 30. And, you know, that was years ago. That was right when they were, that was right when they were, well, about three years after each of them were born because, you know, it takes time to harvest and then put in the bottle and send out to distribution. But, um, you know, in self-reflection, I realized, good Lord, at 21, I wouldn't have known, you know, a wine for, uh, you know, Bartles and James. You know, that's the, you know, the, the old-fashioned, uh, you know, these uh, seltzer water things, these spike seltzers, which are finally in decline, thank God. Um, but so at 30, at 30, they'll be a little initiated. And you know, my daughter's 20, and, you know, she's been, you know, she'll have a glass of wine with us at dinner. And, you know, we'll sneak her a glass even at dinner and break all kinds of laws. So developing a palate and I did with her I took her back to said look why don't you drink California Chardonnays which I've way evolved from and you know uh -huh. I like whites and Chablis so you know anything um, kind of burgundy or Chablis the Chardonnay grape but where it's minerally and kind of dry and yeah yeah the, the, I like the a big... good Chablis it's a crisp white yeah like I, yeah. I, I enjoy every sip of one yeah I don't think the... I know it like you know it but I know that I like it well, that's, I mean, that, that's 99.99% of it if, you know, you drink what you like. And when I was young and getting into business dinners, you know, I thought these big, fruity, full-bodied um, California shards were terrific. And they were because that's what my palate was suited for coming off, you know, drinking largely Coors Light in college. Um, <laughs> but, you you know, your palate gets, uh, you know, your palate changes, you know, it evolves. And, you know, I, th I find myself you know, liking a little more of the old world stuff. So anyhow, I've got some California stuff and I've got some old world stuff for each of the kids when they're 30, which, you know, for those of you out there that are young and having kids, I it's been a fun thing to look at those things in the wine, you know, refrigerators that I have. I got a ton of bottles just in racks and stored in bad conditions in the basement. But, you know, the special juice, I tend to try to keep it the right humidity and uh, temperature. And so, you know, the ones for the kids are certainly in that bucket. And then, you know, when you come down to the house, you know, that that's when I tend to pull out, you know, some of the some of the big gun juice. But, you know, day to day, if we're drinking on Friday or Saturdays, which is typically when we do, I drink at a very low dollar price point that goes back to that value mold. I'm going to assume you buy your wine, your daily drinking wine at Costco, but that may not be a correct assumption. Uh, you know, I do buy at Costco, you know, Costco's Sommelier is the largest wine buyer in the world. Um, but kind of to the discussion, the, it's very California centric. Yeah. They do a little bit in Italy. They do yeah, a little bit a in France. Business. You know, occasionally they get some, okay, you know, they'll, they'll occasionally get some unbelievable wines um, from the old world. But, you know, like after the financial crisis, they were getting a lot more. There mm. were even some, you know, wineries that were private labeling juice that, you know, there was just a surplus of juice and not enough demand. And so, you had some really great wines that were put in, you know, private label bottles and even under the Kirkland banner um, that were great. But, you know, I, I, I used to buy a bunch online, Bill, and, for, and I was strictly buying on price and I knew what I was getting. And, you know, from a couple of good suppliers, I knew where Providence was. There were a couple of guys that would do these gimmicky auctions and the wine of the day. And at a point, I'd bought enough from those guys. And, you know, I kind of, again, back to being able to stick my nose in a glass and know what it is. There were some sellers, um, disreputable, in my opinion, that I'm 99% hmm. highly confident they were pulling the actual juice out of the bottle or they were using fake labels. And so I, I know I was not drinking what I was supposed to be drinking. 
and so I've hmm. dropped those. But now I, I now I like to support one shop, and particularly here in town, you know, their retail markup is a little greater. But these guys are really knowledgeable. They're fun. They're fun to drink with, and I would rather pay, despite being a value guy, a nominally higher price point and support my local merchants on that front. And they go really deep in France and really deep in Italy and really deep in Spain, really deep in bourbon. Um, you know, they're just fun guys and um, love supporting the local guy, you know, despite my affinity for Costco. So it's it's a blend. Yeah. I kind of get my wine all over the place. If uh, if you come down to where I am ever, we'll uh, we'll head over to friend of the pod, Jack Rohrbach's house, and uh, you guys can, can enjoy good wine together. I remember he was telling me he did something, I, I believe similar to what you're describing, where he bought his, he has five children, he bought them bottles of the vintage of their birth, right? And I, th- I think it was his middle daughter threw a rager once, <laughs> and and she she opened a bunch of them, and he was like, what, what is going on here? So she had no idea, but... Um, she wasn't 30 yet throwing the rager. No, she wasn't. They, it wasn't. Uh, it was not approved, and she was too young to enjoy what she was drinking. But uh, I think they all had a good time. <laughs> Different times, man. Different times. Before we get into the investment stuff, I had I heard a rumor that you hold weightlifting records. Is this true? <laughs> yeah, there's there's a there's a um, magazine <clears throat> that has floated around the internet that I hadn't seen forever. And being on Twitter, somebody found, and it was a, a, a you know, I, I will say, I'll say I was a first team high school All American football player and made one of the All American teams. And it, the, the, the write up took the top, I guess, 24 or whatever players, and they listed some of their academic awards and honors. And, you know, some guys had fewer academic awards, but, you know, they also <laughs> lifted your lifts. And so I was a power lifter in high school. And they did some powerlifting meets in college. And so uh, wound up with some pretty decent lifts um, for my size. And, you know, even at the time, um, I think I still hold several high school Colorado State records. And I know in um, the the senior state championship powerlifting meet, I broke the all weight class squat record at 630 wound up ultimately Ooh. squatting 750 in college. Um, I benched 400 in high school, which was far from a state record. Benched 475 in college, which was far from a record. I was at Colorado, and there were a couple guys at Oklahoma State benching over 500. So the bench was not my big lift. Uh, deadlifted. Dude, you were a monster. Yeah, I had some good lifts. My uh, clean was good. I um, wound up cleaning my best was 375 in college and actually ran a 47240 at almost 300 pounds. Um, so I, but you know, like life, I, 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 I believe some, some guys out there probably worked as hard, but I doubt anybody worked harder. Um, and so when I stopped playing football and that was kind of the end of that and I migrated to the investing world, you know, I think I've applied the same work ethic that I learned from, you know, growing up with sports and just the competitive drive you get from it. Um, but I, I lived in the weight room. I mean, there was, again, nobody was going to outwork me. And I also think starting lifting at a very young age, we were kids. I was probably in fifth grade and my father bought, brought home a, a used universal weight machine set. And so, you know, it had the leg press and it had the bench. And so we started lifting it you know, with no routine, but you know, you'd get, you'd want to see how much you could lift for one rep and you're always kind of maxing out and you were doing three, four or five reps and, you do it once a week, do it a couple of days. But I think building a base at a very young age, both my brother and I, my brother was never as big as I was, but he was a great lifter as well. We wound up with a lot of weightlifting records. and But, you know, a lot of that just goes to the hard work and the time spent living in the gym and, you know, trying to make yourself a better football player and a better athlete. Yeah, that's cool. I, somebody had, had told me that I, I had to ask. I said, I knew, he, I knew he played football, but I didn't realize that uh, – I didn't know that you threw weight around quite like that. I guess that that was uh, something I didn't realize. And well, that's what people get on the business brew. They get the insights. <laughs> well, you know, where you are now, the the player of the year who wound up doing okay was on the cover of the magazine. I actually got my mug. There were probably, I think there were eight of us that got our picture in the article. Uh, but the guy that got his picture on the cover was a, was a gentleman named Emmett Smith, who 
you know, some of you guys may have heard of. Um, yeah. From Escambia, yeah, he, uh, Escambia High School. He had a decent school. career, if I recall correctly. Yeah, Escambia uh, High School, played at University of Florida, obviously, and then pretty decent run in the NFL. Um, oh, that was all the line, though. No, I kid. I kid. He's, <laughs> well, he was a monster. But the line did help. I've always wished that uh, I could have seen, you know, in alternate realities. I would have loved to see Barry Sanders behind Emmett Smith's line. I played in college against Barry. Um, Did you really? Yeah, they, he, he was at Oklahoma State. Um, he was backup running back to Thurman Thomas. <laughs> and, yeah, that's right. Um, that's you know, incredible. He was coming, and he had to sit on the bench for a couple of years. But um, I, I, I've never played against a better athlete, better running back. I mean, you know, I, I, I like to think that at the level at which I finally played, you could play blindfolded. And I played defensive line. And so just from technique, you kind of had a sense of where the ball was going to be as, you know, the, the blocking schemes were coming at you. And so you'd find your way to the hole and you'd see a running back and you'd see Barry Sanders in the hole. And there he was and there he wasn't. He would disappear. He had an <laughs> unbelievable ability to just you know pivot and change direction on a dime and that persisted and i tell you yeah you're right you know if you had given him a strong team and a strong offensive line in the nfl he would just got mercilessly beat up um running for the you know the lions as many years as he did and um was such a good athlete and and, and a great guy um you know he would play games, his games at Oklahoma State, and he wouldn't go out and do what the rest of us idiots did and, you know, drink too much beer on Saturday night after the game. He'd go to the library. He was just hmm. a class act. I mean, I wound up coaching my son's football team, tackle football team, from second grade through eighth grade. And that was a joy and a privilege to work with kids, and I'll go back and do that again. That's one of my life highlights was coaching. But, you know, I had these little kids – and I like to, you know, give them life lessons and gather them around for about 10 minutes and just tell them stories. And so I was I was talking about what a class act Barry Sanders was and how he'd score a touchdown and hand the ball to the official. And he was kind of famous for that. And these kids are shaking their head going, coach, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? What do you mean? I don't know what I'm talking about. I played against the guy in college. He said, no, no, no. I mean, Sanders would high step and, you know, run his mouth. And I'm like, Oh, you idiots are talking about Dion, the, the, the other Sanders. Dion, <laughs> the other the Sanders. Sanders. So you all need to look up Barry Sanders. And he, 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 he kind of ran, ran at a different speed than Dion would have run at. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny that they knew Dion. Dion had a cool career, two-athlete two player. That was uh, our two-sport athlete. That was pretty amazing. Um, but, yeah, I would, I, would, uh, I would take Barry to Dion. Um, all day long. Barry's one of one of my all time favorites. I think I have his helmet somewhere around here. Wow. But the um, the signature is rubbed off a little bit over twenty some odd years. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, you're a Chicago guy. Um, I think obviously Walter Payton, you'd put him up. Yeah. You know, right at the top of the best. But I, I'd put Barry Sanders at the top of any of the running backs, and Emmett Emmett wouldn't be far behind. Um, yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Um. Well, turning to investments, uh, first of all, I think people to do their due diligence on you should check out your appearances on Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast. And you recently did one with uh, Chris Powers on a podcast called The Fort. So I don't want to make you rehash uh, what you've spoken about recently. I do think if you don't mind going into a little bit about your philosophy for those that don't know uh, who you are. And if you then don't mind talking a little bit about what these times, you know, remind you of things that you've seen in your career, maybe that's a good place to start the conversation. We'll see where it goes from there. Yeah. You want to start with parallels to, well, I mean, the, the, the obvious to me parallel would be the late nineties, early 2000. Um, yeah. You know, you had a bubble, um, in, in, a large portion of the stock market. Um, you know, you had the, the, the bull market really began in 1982. The bond bull market began in 1981 with long-term rates at 15 point, I think it was seven, eight percent. Short rates were 20. You brought interest rates down. Stocks in the early 80s had really been sideways to down for 17 years. You go back to 1966 and 
Warren Buffett stopped taking new money into his partnership. By 1969, he was returning all of the capital to his partners, suggesting he'd own Berkshire, but if you wanted to own stocks, you know, you can go hang out and give some money to my friend Bill Ruane, but you really ought to own municipal bonds because the market's insanely overvalued and I don't know what I'm doing anymore. And he was right. And it was, you know, a classic peak. Stocks were just about as expensive in the late 60s as they were in 1929. Well, so after that late 60s peak, you know, you had the high inflation of the 1970s, the energy crisis, and your Dow, which traded at 1,000 for the first time in 1966, uh, was trading at 778, I believe, in July of 1982. Maybe Oof. it was August of 82. In any event, so you were down on the order of almost 25% peak to trough over 17 years when inflation averaged kind of mid to high single digits. And so the investor had lost 75% of the purchasing power of capital during that bear market. Nobody wanted to own a stock. Household ownership of stocks, institutional ownership of stocks was very low, record lows, you know, kind of back to de depression era, 1932 lows. But stocks were a dead giveaway. Um, you know, you could have owned the long bond, like I say, at north of 15 and, you know, locked in great returns, but you could own stocks at seven times a 3% profit margin, which gets you to 21% of sales. And so, you know, you adjust stock prices for interest rates and what have you. And some argued that stocks were expensive, which was insane. And, but that, that launched the bull market and peaked on trough to peak then, the S&P averaged almost 20% into March of 2000. And so that last four years of the 1990s was really when you started getting a bubble. Alan Greenspan had talked about irrational exuberance. The NASDAQ four years prior to the peak, five years prior to the peak was 1,000. It wound up peaking at 5,000. When the S&P peaked at 1,520 in March of 2000, and then again, it took a while to roll over, but even in September, uh, the S&P traded back to its high, even though the breadth of the market was really breaking down. And you, you were genuinely in the bear market for you know, six months prior to people actually realizing you were there. But that last four years was crazy. Um, and what happened was you had the, the peaking of the big blue chips, you know, which you'd call the new iteration of the Nifty 50, which, you know, you know the 50 blue chip stocks traded at 40 to 50 times earnings in 1972. Uh, way ahead of fundamentals and then went into a nasty bear market. The S&P and the Dow dropped 50% from 1973 to 1974. It took years for a lot of those high flyers to get back to even. Um, so, you know, you get to the, 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 the late 90s and, and the blue chips peaked in 98 and that would be kind of GE and, you know, the, the AT&T and the Baby Bell spinoffs everything was really expensive. Um, so and then the next year and a half, so those, those blue chips started rolling over. Walmart rolled over. Coca-Cola rolled over. The big blue chips started getting cheaper. And everybody was chasing tech. And at the peak of the tech bubble, the NASDAQ traded at 242 times earnings. And that's where I see a lot of parallels to today. You had a bifurcation in the market. You know, you were a 401k investor, profit sharing plan investor, individual, even institutions. And you were chasing performance. You'd get your quarterly statement or your monthly statement and say, my God, these tech funds, the NASDAQ was up 84% in 1999. Well, we had started our firm in 98 and our stocks did 20 something percent in our first year and kind of kept pace with the S&P 500, maybe even outperformed it a little bit. But everybody wanted to know why, why we didn't own any tech. Mm -hmm. And you had, you had the real tech businesses <clears throat> that were making genuine high levels of profits. And you also had a lot of the, the internet kind of new tech, new media, fashionable businesses that were all being invested on the com. So, you know, in the, in the camp of the real businesses, Microsoft sat at the top of the heap. I spent about six pages and a series of predictions in my January 1, 2000 client letter talking specifically about Microsoft as a proxy for the overall tech bubble. So you can pick your name, but Microsoft had been public for about 15 years. 
and the stock had compounded at north of 60%, sales had compounded at 40 something percent, they were doing a 38% after tax profit margin, and the stock traded at 620 billion on 20 billion in revenues, and they were doing mm. around seven and a half billion in profits, so 80 plus times earnings. And I simply argued, you cannot repeat for the next 15 what you've done for the last 15 because the market cap would be in the quadrillions of dollars. They had been dilutive with enormous amounts of stock options given to the employees. Over that run of the last seven or eight years, dilution was 40% of the company. Um, but I, you know, I simply said, this is a great business. There's no knock on Microsoft. If you're a chief technology or chief inf information officer, you're not going to replace the operating system. You're not going to replace the Word, Excel, PowerPoint suite. And this business will continue to grow, but it can't grow at the same rate at which it had. And the stock certainly can't repeat. And so I argued that shareholders at that point would lose money for 15 years, which they did, including the dividends that they started paying, including the $3 special dividend they played after, paid after a few years. I mean, I was out buying the stock six, seven years later when it traded at 10 times earnings. I mean, think about that. Yeah, the stock traded down nuts. from over 80 times to 10 times. And at that point, it was, a, it was a hated stock. But, you know, the big businesses like Oracle and Sun Microsystems and Cisco and the genuinely profitable companies traded at exorbitant prices that had pulled forward anywhere from a decade to 20 years worth of future performance. Some of those companies like Lucent wound up not making it. You know, there were a lot of the new technologies that did not make it, but then you had this whole myriad group of internet type companies and everybody was all about the internet. GE was all about the internet. Jack Welch talked incessantly about B2C and B2B and everybody forgets that or they're not initiated to it. But you had this whole crop of companies that had recently gone public, didn't produce a dime of profit and were being valued at 20, 30, 40 times revenues. And it was all bets on the com. And there are a whole bunch of those kinds of companies today. Twitter, Shopify, you know, some of these things may wind up being great businesses, but when you're paying, you know, 10 times, 20 times, 30 times revenues for companies that don't generate a profit, it's a tough road to hoe because, you know, a lot of those companies will not get there. You take a company like a Twitter and extrapolate 10 years of, say, sales growth at, uh, 15% a year and run a 20 or 30% profit margin. If you run it at a 20% profit margin, I would guess you'd, you know, factor in dilution of maybe 4% a year. And somebody has got to convince me that they're not going to keep giving shares away. And when you consider the shares that are already outstanding and unvested comprising RSUs and options, there's an enormous amount of overhang. So, you know, you assume maybe 40 or 50% dilution over the course of a decade and stocks trading for, you know, 20 times or 25 times what they're going to earn in the most op optimistic sense a decade hence. You take any of these, you know, great businesses to your point. I mean, the ones that, that are just obvious great companies that you pay any price for. And at the end of the day, Price matters. And when prices get to extremes, they really matter. I mean, I went a little bit after ARC and I took great exception to Kathy Wood's price target forecast report on Tesla back in March, where she suggested that the stock would trade at $3,000 a share by 2025. And you got into the assumptions behind that report. And there's just no mathematical, no realistic way to get there on a business fundamental case when you objectively re measure the, the revenues from each of the various subsidiaries and, and, and industries they think they're going to disrupt. The mathematics were impossible. And I think, you know, either delusional or intentionally puffed to promote inflows into the funds. But, you know, her portfolio for the better part of, well, for the six, seven years prior to 2020, you know, if you take the aggregate of those companies, as I do every year in my annual letter, and when I look at our portfolio, I aggregate on a, a, a size weighted, uh, you know, percentage in the portfolio weighted basis, uh, each of my companies as though they're a single business and measure all the fundamentals, measure, you know, balance sheet characteristics, return on capital characteristics, 
And so you, you, you do the same for what was Kathy's portfolio for the first six years. And the thing traded for three to five times sales. Um, it's an, in aggregate, the companies don't make any profit. And so you can't measure it on a PE basis. You can extrapolate forward like I just did with Twitter. And my math on Twitter was probably wrong. That's you know off the top of my head. But that's the exercise you have to go through. Well, you get her to 2020 and she made 150% in her main fund. And so the entire ETF was, I think, $1.9 billion at the end of 2019. It makes 150%, which would take you to $4.5 billion. How big do you think the fund was? How big do you think the ETF was at the end of 2020, starting at $1.9 billion? Just based on flows and whatnot? Just I mean, based I, on flows. Well, flows, yeah. and, flows and returns. Returns would have gotten you to four and a half. Yeah. Oh, man. I, it's got to be north of 10, but that's not even close to high enough. I don't even know how to guess this number because I'm going to end up low or just obscenely high. No, uh, you're, no, you're, no you're, you're exactly correct. It was north yeah. of 10. 17.7 billion. Yeah. When you look I, at, I was going to go north at twenty, just because I think when flows happen like that, they can really get out of out of control. But seventeen, well, surprise no, me. extrapolate three months forward, the flows continued. So you had somewhere on the order of ten billion that flowed in in the back half of two thousand and twenty. The money didn't come yeah. in in March and April and May. It came in after Tesla had had its rally, after it had been added to the S and P five hundred, after it had done its stock split. And then in the first three months of the year, another 10 billion or so flowed in. So you start off 2021 at 17.7 billion. It's down, I don't know, six or 7% for the year. So it should be about a $15 billion fund, 15 and a half, whatever. It was $25 yeah. billion dollars at the end of June. Yeah, that doesn't shock so, me. So, so the, the parallels there. And now at the end of June, her portfolio was trading for 15 times revenues not the three to five times that it had, it had traded for for the entire history. And so you just take the price back down to three to five times revenues. That's a 65 to an 80% decline. Now you've got redemptions coming out of the fund, and that reminds me almost to a T of Janus. Yeah, this is, Janus what, this is what uh, Toby talks about quite a bit too. He's like, this, is, this feels similar. Now, when... You know, I'm going to play devil's advocate in this conversation. Uh, wouldn't it make sense, though, that now people have realized how great these companies are going to be? They didn't understand how great these companies were when they were trading at three to five times sales. And this is sort of the new re-rating that, um, like, why why will those companies go back to three to five times sales, I guess, is the question. Because aren't they just fantastic companies that people have realized? Well, they don't have to, you know, you can, you can grow into your valuation. And so you run kind of a best case, say, say the growth rate in revenues for the aggregate of her 55 companies or any portfolio of some of these, you know, um, more spec businesses that don't yet make money. And, and I'm not just, you know, singling out Kathy and her portfolio because there are plenty of folks running money and there are plenty of stocks out there that that, that resemble and uh, represent these characteristics. And I'm talking big multiples to sales with no profits yet. So if, if, if you take a 10-year period of time that matches what the big five tech stocks that sit at top of the stock market, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Facebook, you take those five, they had grown their market caps total returns, some were issuing shares, some were buying back shares. So they made about 20% for a decade. Revenues had grown at high teens. Profits had grown at a higher clip. Amazon's been growing into its profitability. They were not making money for a long time. Now they're making a 6.5% profit margin. You know, the billion dollar question there is, what does that margin structure look like at maturity? We can have that discussion, but so if you take if you take a portfolio of you know these fifteen times sales companies, forget Kathy. Let's just let's just take the universe of the fifteen times. Well, those were the best performing stocks in twenty twenty. I did a thing in my annual letter this year, and I took price to sales measured by year 
prospective returns for one year, two year, three year, four year. And I did these rolling, you know, all the way back to 1999. And your last iteration when you traded at the same crazy multiples to sales was the end of 99, early 2000, right at the peak. And you had a really bad experience. You, you, you lost a bunch of money over the next five, 10 years, 15 years. Some of those companies made it, two or three made it, but most did not. And most flamed out and you lost a bunch of money. You're sitting here at the same type valuation today. So you don't have to go back to three, three to five times. Yeah. So if, I, so if, so if you give them 20% sales growth, which is really hard to do, I mean, yeah. It's really hard to grow at 20% top line for a decade, okay? If you allow them to grow into a 30% profit margin, which now gets you into the realm of those five tech stocks, some earn less, Amazon earns way less, Microsoft is back to earning 37%, having dropped from its 38% margin back in 2000 all the way down to 22%. I had modeled a decline over all those years, dropping to 20 well, all of a sudden, on the back of subscription software and Azure, they're back to a 37% profit margin. The damn thing's back to where it was in 2000. But you know, the stock has only done 7.5%. 7.5% from the peak. So you lost money for 15 years, and you've you know, peaked, you know, peak, peak to peak, done 7.5, which kind of matches the S&P because the S&P was equally overvalued in March of 2000. So you take these high-flying stocks and allow them to grow to a 30% margin, 20% top-line growth, and capitalize them at 30 times earnings. I mean, that's best-case top-line. That's best-case margin-wise. That's best-case valuation-wise. In aggregate, you make a single-digit return. If yeah. profit margin only gets to 20%, <clears throat> you make four or five. If you wind up getting diluted by a factor of two or three or four percent, which is, you know, at a minimum what's coming out of those companies across the broad stock market, the S&P 500, the dilution factor on the front end is two percent of shares being given away. And that gets masked by companies spending more than 55 percent of their profits with 45 percent coming out as dividends. They're spending more than the balance of their profits, augmenting with debt the repurchase of shares to buy back 3% of their market cap per year. So you're net shrinking the share count by only 1%. So you're masking that dilution that comes out. Well, these companies that don't make any money are famous for giving prodigious amounts of stock options and RSUs away. I mean, Tesla, after Elon was in control, years after he was in control, was awarded in a series of two grants, 20% of the company. Yeah. Yeah, I remember these grants. <laughs> and so... You know, Bill, so you can grow into a best case scenario, but if you're Twitter and you use the math I just ran through, you, you've already priced the thing for where it best case could kind of be 10 years from now. You don't, you don't make any money. So if you're going to make a mid single digit return, you've got to get the whole portfolio, not just one or two companies. I mean, so if you take 55 companies or you take a couple hundred companies or however many you know, 400, 500 companies traded through these ridiculous multiples of sales, figure out how many of them are really going to make it. Most of them will not make it. The winners, if they exhibit those characteristics of 20% top line growth, margins of 30%, 30 multiple to terminal earnings, that's the best case, but you can't take and assume the best case for all those companies. So, you know, the average investor in Janus came in late in the game, and lost a bunch of money. The majority of Janus shareholders lost money. The majority of Kathy's shareholders are now underwater because so much money came in in the back half of 2020 and the first three months of this year, they're sitting on losses. And that's where kind of the trigger mechanism comes into play. When you've come into this game late and you were not an early investor in some of these companies and you've not enjoyed six, seven, eight years of spectacular compounding and you come in looking at trailing gains and you expect those gains to persist and you don't get those returns, at the point where you're underwater, you either get margin called out or you simply sell because you can't handle it. And that's where I think in you know, the world of retail investors and common stocks and even extended to a number of institutions and professional investors, most investors lose money because they buy high and they sell low. And you know, you're primed today with a valuation extreme, especially in that kind of that new IPO growthy techie sphere. Um, 
where things are priced very similar to what I saw in the late nineties. And, um, just yeah, there, aren't, there aren't enough investors that live that, breathe that, experience that. So, you know, hopefully some, you know, th there are those that, that take some of the perspective from guys like me that lived through it, and navigated it very well, by the way. I mean, we made 30-ish percent during a 50% decline in the S&P and an 80% decline in the NASDAQ because under the surface, under all that tech stuff, there were some phenomenal smaller and mid-cap businesses that were being given away because... The guy that got his 401k statement sold his small cap value fund, sold his mid cap value fund because he wanted to chase tech. And the same thing's happening today. There is a bifurcation in the market. It's not as extreme, but Bill, I'm buying assets in the last six months and I'm buying them here in the last week, earlier this week at low single digit multiples to cash flow, not earnings, cash flow, businesses that make a bunch of money. Um, they exist. Well, are these yeah. all cyclicals, though, Chris? This is the natural question. Yeah, those, right? yeah, those, yeah. How do yeah. how do we know that it's normalized uh, cash flows? Right, would be the the natural question. Yeah, that that's that's the uh, that that's the trick, and I think that's where that's where investing cyclically is very hard to do, and you know I think you've got to be a little initiated to being able to ferret out kind of mid cycle. <clears throat> valuations and, and you've also got to believe that there's there's a, a a bull case to the commodity if you will underlying the business that you're not in a permanent you know state of decline and so for that i mean i've got big concentration in energy today and there are a lot of investors that won't touch energy um, either yeah. for for esg reasons or because they believe we're going to ev we're going to solar we're going to wind and you know, the, the carbon footprint companies are going to get crushed. And, you know, I happen to paint a completely different scenario based on what I think is reality. But for that, you've got assets being given away for nothing um, that are producing a lot of cash. And your break evens wind up not being very long when you're paying low single digit multiples to cash flow. Um, and in today's environment, so you don't, so you don't even need the recovery in the commodity. In fact, you, know, you don't have to have peak levels in oil or nat gas or some of the other things that I own. You've just got to kind of get to today's level of profitability. And, you know, they're, they're minting money, but they're, they're assets that a lot of investors and a growing number in, of investors either will not own or cannot own. Yeah, I think, um, I think when it comes to those kind of ideas, the question that I usually ask myself is, why are the cash flows going to come back to me? Um, because I always get worried that the cyclical will generate a ton of cash and then go out and spend on another uh, oil project or another sawmill or whatever it is that um, that they that they may end up spending on. But um, I do not disagree that there is such a large aversion to those kind of ideas, at least among the people that I interact with, and potentially that's because of who I spend my day interacting with but it's very very hard to get people to be remotely interested in a cyclical idea in a world of uh compounders and tech ideas i think that's objectively true i i wanted to ask you to give you the opportunity to discuss because you do these threads on twitter uh whether or not it's arc or whether or not it's tesla what is like what's the purpose behind doing those because i i think uh one it's a good way to get your message out and two i think you're ringing a, a bit of an alarm bell but i do want to ask you what's behind that because it does appear to take a lot of time uh when you when you put those out well there was no there was no forethought into pointing out various inconsistencies and I think in a lot of cases pointing out some abuses that are taking place today I you know you know ha having seen the retail investor sucked in to the bubble in the late 90s having seen the retail investor sucked into the bubble in 2007 you know investors got sucked into real estate same thing happened in the 60s the Manhattan fund um, you know I think you know, if Goldman Sachs wants to screw over a hedge fund or two, so be it. We're all big boys and big girls, right? But the abuses today are, in many cases, far beyond what we saw in the late 90s. And, you know, my my, my letter when I wrote up Microsoft and said you're going to lose money for 15 years, that 
wasn't self-serving. That went to my clients. I didn't have a distribution list where the broad public was reading that letter. I had pressure from our clients wanting to know why we didn't own tech and why we didn't own Microsoft, which was 5% yeah. of the S&P 500. And so I needed to articulate to the best of my ability why you would lose money for 15 years and why you can't chase recent trailing performance. So, you know, I, I should probably, in being on Twitter, and I blame and thank in the same breath O'Shaughnessy for getting me on Twitter. <laughs> we had done an early podcast, and he had asked me even prior uh, as I was getting to know him and we were having drinks and what have you, what I thought about Twitter. I thought, I don't think about Twitter. and No, nah, I, I don't do social media. Uh, I write an annual letter, and if you want to see what I have to say, read the letter. It takes 100 pages, and there are a lot of thoughts there. Anyhow, we recorded and released it, and I was with my daughter at Sea Island. She was taking some golf lessons, and we were playing a couple rounds of golf. And So he released the thing that week, and on Friday or Saturday, he sent me an email saying, hey, we've had you know 28 billion listeners to the podcast in the last four days or whatever the number was. It was less than 28 billion by a lot. But <laughs> I thought it was a big number. It'll be lower than that on this one, I assure you. <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. We're doing the video and we're doing the That's the true. Anyhow, he said, uh, you ought to think about Twitter. And I replied, man, I don't know. I mean, I, it's just doesn't seem like my bag. I don't want to you know, be out there daily. You know, we've got compliance issues with, you know, talking publicly to the general public. Um, anyhow, he said, look, I, I'm going to give you the pros and the cons. The pros are you're going to meet a lot of great people. And you'll even develop some friendships from it. And I kind of poo-pooed that. And he said, you're also going to meet some allocators. And there are a lot of folks that are running institutional money and family office money and just really smart, savvy people that, that tune in to these podcasts, but, you know, spend a lot of time on Twitter. And there are some thoughtful people there. He said, the downside is if you really get into it, you're going to wind up consuming way more time than I know you want to spend with it because... Your time <laughs> That's a period. very honest assessment of what Twitter is. And and he said, and there are some assholes, and th there are a few. And, um, you know, on all four points, the two pros, two cons, check the box, and he was exactly right. But anyhow, he, um, you know, when I was I was hemming and hawing, <clears> and so we're, Lucy and I were sitting there at dinner, and he, he sent me an email saying, check your Twitter, because I did have a Twitter account, my Lucy and my wife had set it up for me like a year prior and I had one follower which was my daughter uh, and I, I never even looked at it I didn't I, I wasn't initiated how it worked I didn't wasn't following anybody and so I had zero follow I actually had I think I had I was following Warren Buffett who had sent six tweets out to that point and so I had one follower one following um, so Patrick you know retweeted out the podcast interview and he introduced the notion that I was now on Twitter. I said, yeah. Lucy, oh my God. I think I remember I this now? actually. Like, well, I have no idea what to do. And she says, well, you have to tweet something out. <laughs> I said, how, <laughs> how the hell do you do that? So we sat there at dinner and I crafted a little message and kind of copied the, the first of the Buffett tweets saying, um, you know, I was now in the house or whatever, and maybe I'll do this more than six times over the next six years. And you know, kind of the rest is history. And, you know, I learned it's a valuable tool. There are some thoughts. Yeah. But I would tweet about Berkshire and fun stuff and tweet about wine. And, you know, I, I, I said something about Tesla at a point. And it wasn't a big long thread. I just made some innocuous comment. And the vitriol that I got back was pretty extraordinary. I mean, it was common. Oh, yeah, man. You and the Tesla crew, uh, you guys like to clash. Well, I took that to the next level and uh, did one of my, I don't know, long 20, 30, 40. So, you know, those 20, 30, 40 threads. Oh, yeah. Are not I'm aware of them, Chris. So so when I when I do the long ones, I write them out in Word or in notes or whatever. And, you know, it's, it's a page, page and a quarter. I mean, I write a hundred and plus page client letter. It doesn't take me long to spend three or four paragraphs. And just kind of randomly jot down thoughts. What what takes the time? So it, it'll take me ten to fifteen minutes to write the thing. It doesn't yeah. take a lot. But then I'm not doing a lot of deep research. I'm just talking about what I know. But then you got to take the damn thing and fit it into each of those little boxes, which is insanity. Some have said, "Why don't you just do a blog?" Like, well, yeah, you could sign up for a review 
Or maybe you could pay Twitter for Twitter Blue, get some of this optionality that's priced into the stock to start to generate some revenue, like I am on Superfollows, though not much. Uh, you know, and then and then they can uh, justify the share price. And then wouldn't that be fun? You know, I, I did not fully answer your, your question about Twitter strategy and what, what the hell I'm doing is, you know, at the end of the day, when I when I realized the feedback I got from Twitter and then kind of went after simply the valuation and made the similar case to Tesla that I did to Microsoft, you know, the, the year evolved and SPACs became a thing. And having looked at SPACs in their early iteration, six, seven, you know, 10 years ago, even more, it's just a bad capital structure. Um, you know, guys like Chamath come along and favorably compared himself to Warren Buffett, which was an insane comparison. And when I then yes, read his annual report, it was, it was offensive. Um, I mean, just unfounded in, in reality pushing pushing the 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 line on uh, ethics and perhaps even law you know you're raising money in the capital markets from public investors and in my mind fraudulently would be a heavy word but you're you're misrepresenting returns you're you're shedding them in the most favorable light you're presenting gross and not net um, you're running five funds and you're you're presenting your returns in aggregate and not for each of the five. There was just a lot that was poor. But then the selectivity of how he chose Berkshire Hathaway's returns was just off the charts, um, egregious. So there, there are those things. But, you know, it, the spirit, Bill, of all of those various tweets and threads that I've sent are really, at the end of the day, with an eye toward the retail investor um, being abused by larger pools of capital. And it's the same thing that happened in the late 90s. I had zero mouthpiece. Again, my client letter was a private document. It was read just by my clients and you know 20 or 30 friends. Um, so I've got a little more of a platform now. And given the degree of pushback that I've received, I realize, good Lord, there are a lot of guys out there that have totally... Uh, been consuming the Kool-Aid, and they're going to get hurt. And if, you know, somebody with a little bit of experience and gray hair who's seen some of these things, who's, you know, in my mind, not over the hill, but pretty rational about how valuation works and how business works, you know, if you can shed a little light on some of the abuses and some of the just blatant speculation instead of investing, I hope I'm doing um, a service and not just picking on other people. And I I don't want to have a reputation of being a bad guy. I mean, you've known me. I don't yeah, think Yeah, I don't guy. think you have a reputation of being a bad guy. The only thing that I've asked <clears throat> myself is, is this Chris's highest and best use of time? And what I have come to a lot of the times when I've asked that is I do think fundamentally you have a view uh, and you're expressing it. And I, you know, as somebody who has has seen your work and i know how hard you work at doing things the right way um i th i think that you know it's very cool that we live in a world where you can get your message out and you're either going to be right or wrong in the fullness of time but i don't think that um well, I know for a fact that you're not doing it in a schmucky way, which I see a lot of people doing things in schmucky ways, and I'm glad that there are voices like you pushing back on it. You know, I, I'm trying to uh, to navigate the landscape in the best way that I know how, and I think that I'm not immune from some of the mistakes that, that some people are making. I hope that I'm not amplifying those mistakes with the podcast, um, but I'm trying to... Uh, you know, do my part to, to give back to um, in whatever way I'm capable of doing so. At least the intent is good here. I, I'm not, I can't attest to the mind and the ideas, but the intent I can. So we'll see how that all turns out in the fullness of time too. Well, I think you're doing a great job with it. I think the platforms that you've built and developed are just super. Um, I think the messages that you're sharing and the light that you're shedding on various issues be it Robin Hood or what have you, uh, have just been, you know, of, of the noblest of character. You know, I, I, at a lot of levels, I'm at the point in my life where 
I really want to give back, and I spend a lot of time on college campuses talking to students, investing clubs, um, you know, the groups that run their uh, sleeves of the university endowments. And I've taken my letter, and I have done this for years, but, you know, I've always been so appreciative of Warren Buffett and the give back of the time he spent, particularly in the early years, you know, less so in the last five, six, seven um, He's just not really in teaching mode anymore, but he spent yeah, well, the majority tough, of his career and he, he's, he's in teaching in age. mode. Yeah, so he's just, I mean, he's done it. He's, hes you know, the, the 40 page letters where he's teaching about various nuances of the capital markets and morality and ethics and how they interweave. Um, he doesn't, he's just not going to do it anymore. I doubt that I'll be doing it. And I know I won't be doing it in that fashion in 90. In fact, I told him, this year, um, my goal was to shrink my annual letter by 2.6 pages per year, such that when I'm 90, I'll be writing the same <laughs> the same length letter that he is. Um, I like it. That's fine. But you know, I, I, I've molded. Uh, you know, a lot of my mindset has been molded by some of these greats, investing greats that have given back that did not have to take their time to write and built a foundation on things that work and things that don't work, but have learned a lot of lessons vicariously through some of the great investors and some of their teachings. And, you know, to the extent I can give back to the next generation of investors. And so, you know, my letter is read by broad swath. It's read by Mr. Buffett at one end and it's read by, you know, some high school kids, but it's read, you know, pretty widely on, on college campuses and by young investors. And I, I hope there's some teaching aspects and, and some things that I've learned over my 30 years as a professional investor that I'm able to pass on. That That's become more and more important to me as I've spent more and more time in what I think is this great profession. I look at our, our my world as a profession and not as a business. Yeah. And, you know, for that, I've kind of created this public persona in various aspects where those who read what I write or, you know, listen to you and I yammer on here um i hope there's some utility for some of the things we're talking about uh as do i <clears throat> i gotta tell you something that kind of pisses me off about where we're at is i i really don't like um that people cite berkshire's share performance over the last 10 years as some sort of indictment on either buffett's uh like vision and or capability to uh, execute and and um, you know it, it just uh, he's super underappreciated and I think it's amazing to be able to put up the numbers that he's put up for the amount of time and to still have people come at him and like even what he has done with Berkshire Hathaway Energy it's as if people don't think he builds businesses. I mean, that that business, what, what it has turned into and what it does for the American economy and, and uh, Burlington Northern, like, I, I, it, it's shocking to me that people take shots at him. I mean, sometimes I think uh, maybe I'm a little bit overly of a fanboy, but at the same time, you know, it's, uh, it's odd to me how, how a share price appears uh, to be driving narrative at this stage when a lot of it can just be chalked up to the entity might be too big to generate outsized returns. Maybe not, but I think Charlie would argue um, it's probably not going to put up hugely outsized returns given the size. And two, there's a lot of internal capital allocation decisions that, that impact people's lives that they don't actually see every day. But, you know, because the stock doesn't rip, people think that it's not going on, I think. I don't, I don't know if, if my version of reality is true, but it feels that way at times. No, I think it's spot on. You, any performance record, anybody's performance record is bracket endpoint sensitive. You can take a three-month period of time or a four-year period of time or a 10-year period of time and at a point somebody will have outperformed somebody. Somebody will have beat an index. Somebody will have underperformed an index. You know, I, I measure the, the next kind of most recent iteration of Berkshire after they bought Gen Re. Berkshire's stock was extremely expensive, trading at 2.9 times book. 
the common stock portfolio, which was 115% of Berkshire's book value, was equally expensive. Coca-Cola was 35 plus percent, almost 40% of the stock portfolio, and it was trading with those nifty 50s, the new iteration in 98 at nosebleed prices, 200 billion market cap, you know, trading at 40 times earnings. Um, Berkshire needed to grow into its valuation. The common stock portfolio needed to grow in the valuation. The gen retransaction was seminal, using the stock, paying 22 billion when Berkshire shares were only worth half that in my mind, uh, worth 11 billion, tripling the float, growing the assets of the firm by 75% and only being diluted, only increasing the share count by between 20 and 25%. Brilliant transaction. And so from that point though, expensive stock, expensive portfolio, Berkshire's book value compounded at 10. The S&P 500 is compounded at 7.2 or 7.3. And I run, Bill, as you know, in my letter each year, both a forward and a backward compound annual growth series. For Berkshire's change in book value per share, which was the original yardstick they used until about 15 years ago, and then they introduced the S&P 500, selectively yeah. Berkshire's stock had outperformed the book value, and so I think there was some <laughs> a little bit of selection, perhaps introducing yeah. the second metric. But then they always showed versus the S&P. But at the bottom of that table, they always showed you the compound annual from inception, and that was it. You didn't get the one-year return, two-year, forward and backward. So I started running the forward and the backward, uh, particularly when the book value per share was dropped as one of the utility measures in that table. So I will always run it. But so I've got the compound series from the beginning of time, which is 20%. And I've also got the backward compound series. So, you know, at the end of last year, Berkshire stock was only up 2.4%. Well, this year it's up, you know, 17, 18. For the better part of this year, it was, it's been ahead of the S&P 500. Um, I think it boils down to expectations and, you know, journalism sells. And as, as Berkshire became a more known entity, as you got into the 1980s, certainly the late 1980s and, you know, throughout the 90s, you're going to be a lightning rod when you're that successful. You know, Mr. Buffett's been a lightning rod for the passive crowd, arguing that it's a fluke, that nobody can beat the market over time. And there's some gimmick to this or it's just luck and you run a number of coin flips in a row and you're going to have that one in a billion that can do it. Yeah. Like Charlie says, people just keep adding a Sigma to their out <laughs> to their outcomes. Right. Yeah. And, but yes. And so going in, you have to have a rational set of expectations for what the business can do. The aggregation of the utilities, which are brilliantly run and with brilliant capital allocation, the railroad, the manufacturing service, retail, and now finance businesses, the insurance operations. You have to have a rational set of expectations for what those individual businesses and all of the 80 plus subsidiaries can earn. And I, I jumped through a bunch of accounting hoops to get to a number that's now north of $45 billion is what I would call normalized, kind of normalized profitability for Berkshire and measured against their stated book value, you get to about a 10 ROE, okay? The, the stock is going to compound in line with the intrinsic value growth of the business. And for the last 20, 22 years, the last 10 years, it's done exactly that. I don't have an expectation that I'm going to earn much more than 10% on my Berkshire shares. And I can tell you that having bought it for the first time in February 2000, after the stock had been cut in half after the Gen Re deal, I paid 105% of book value. It, remember, it traded at 2.9 times book two years prior. I've hmm. bought it well over the years. So my clients and, and my own, you know, my, you know, Semper's Capital has had a slightly better experience than the average Berkshire shareholder experience because we've bought the thing so well. But I don't expect to make much more than 10 and that's what it's done. So you're going to have a period that excludes 2008's 40% decline in the stock market. You've had a rip-roaring bull market, much like you had 
from 1982 to 2000. And you're going to have a lot of people that when you pick those endpoint brackets, you can say they're really stupid. But yeah. you, you got to rationally look at what you actually ought to expect the business as measured by the underlying fundamentals of the business to do and whether that translates into a stock price being high or low. I mean, if last year the S&P was up high teens and Berkshire's stock price was up 2-4, does that mean Warren Buffett's an idiot? He can't control the yeah, stock no, price in the short all. term, yeah, yeah. but he can sure control the accretion of value and the allocation of capital toward Berkshire Hathaway Energy, which does not send a dividend ever up to the parent. Every dime of what's now $4 billion in profits is reinvested, appropriately levered at kind of an equal mix of debt and equity, which is how utilities are operated. And so they're spending enormous amounts of growth capex, building out, serving public policy at a regulated return, building out wind and solar infrastructure. They're building out the grid, which does not exist to serve these disparate new supplies of power. You know, solar, when you drive through California and Nevada and Arizona, as I've done with Lucy here back and forth the last few years, these solar fields are unbelievable. They're enormous. The wind power you see all over the country is enormous. Well, that, that's disparately geographically located power. There's no grid that exists, and somebody's got to build it. Very complicated projects. Berkshire works with Qit, other contractors, to get this stuff done, the permitting process to make it all work. But I can tell you, nobody has the capital. Nobody has the capital that Berkshire has. Other utilities are not run with a policy of not paying dividends. Utilities are generally retail, fashionably yeah. constructed entities that distribute the majority of their profits. So if they're going to grow, they have to issue new capital, be it equity or debt capital. Berkshire has the high class problem of retaining every damn dime of profit that it makes. And they're getting regulated returns on you know, high single digit, call it 10% returns in a world of very low interest rates. They're driving their borrowing costs down. They're lengthening the duration of their, their debt structure, those businesses are appropriately levered. The vast majority of debt that exists in Berkshire, which is less than the aggregate cash in Berkshire, resides in the utilities and the railroad. Railroads earning, you know, teens returns on capital. The utilities are earning 10-ish returns on capital. These are great investments, but in the aggregate of all of Berkshire, it'll make 10. I think the, the rest of my portfolio will and should do better, but Berkshire is my largest holding because it's by far the most knowable. I mean, in a world of no interest rates, I can't own bonds. You know, a retired yeah, how I feel. individual. I, mean, I I don't. You know, I look at I look at Berkshire as a bond surrogate, as yeah. a very predictable kind of a ten ROE business. And if I don't overpay for it, you know, I can sit back and count on a very predictable return because the, these are businesses that are not being disrupted not being dislocated. There are some companies that no longer earn their cost of capital inside that MSR group, and they'll appropriately deal with those. But, you know, the capital allocation that's taking place is as good as can be expected. It's brilliant, given, given the hand that you have, given you know, $470 billion at June 30 in shareholders' equity, over $900 billion in firm assets. It's the largest business in the world by tangible capital, tangible assets. And it can earn 10 in a world of no interest rates and in a world where the overall stock market is now so expensive, you can pick these three-year, five-year, seven-year periods and say, Mr. Buffett's an idiot because he's underperformed the market. Well, you're at the tail end of another bubble. Stock market's as expensive as it was in 2000 in the late 1960s and 1929. So sure, an entity that only should earn 10% a year will look like it's failed. And the journalists will come out of the woodwork and the naysayers come out of the woodwork, but to be critical but not have an understanding set of what should be expected of a business is just folly. And, you know, I enjoy watching the naysayers. And, you know, if enough if enough of them jump on the bandwagon and keep the stock cheap, then Berkshire yeah, well, can, then buy, you can back, buy it in. You know, spend 100% of its operating income buying back shares, as it's done for the last couple of years. So, so how do you think about, uh, or, or like, let's not necessarily talk about your portfolio let's let's just give a hypo 
Um, how do you think about like opportunity cost of adding a security when there's, you know, something like Berkshire that you feel like you can count on? Um, because so I, I've got myself in a shitstorm on Altice uh, from at least from a price perspective. And I would argue from a business perspective, too, it was probably a dumb bet. Um, but, you know, I here I got enticed by a low price and I think I made a, a mistake uh, if it was a mistake. We'll sort of see how it all turns out. But um, hard to argue that the bet was certainly it wasn't timed well, uh, if nothing else. How, you had mentioned in a interview uh, with Chris Powers that when Nike went direct, you would avoid something like Foot Locker. I think I am. I, I found myself in a similar but different position where I bet on a weaker business because the odds offered out of the gate were were more attractive to me, but the certainty of return ha, is lower, and I am feeling the pain that a young Chris may have felt too, but an, an older Chris has trained himself to avoid. How do you think about opportunity cost of capital and when maybe going down business quality is worth your perception of increased return? Like, you know, you're talking about energy, right? That's a cyclical. We just talked about how confident you are in Berkshire. Like why does energy belong in the portfolio and how do you think through those kind of decisions? Well, it it is, Bill. It's it's all as I've gotten ex more experienced and with a better understanding of the nuances of how capital works and how returns are generated and derived from investing in common stocks and businesses or investing in in various other assets and asset classes. I've got a pretty good understanding of how of how of how returns are, are, are generated over longer periods of time. I mean, we have no idea what's going to happen in the short term. Yeah. So boils down to opportunity cost. The opportunity set that existed on March 23rd of 2020 is an entirely different opportunity set that exists today. Yep. And I have learned to use Berkshire Hathaway as my initial opportunity cost benchmark. Yeah, that I've got makes a sense very, very confident 10 to 15 year assessment of what my return ought to be from owning Berkshire. And you can drill it down to as simple as what's the business going to earn on its equity capital? Book value may have more or you know, are, you know more, more likely less utility over time as a proxy of value. But I can measure the earning power of Berkshire. And I can do it through each of the subsidiaries on a sum of the parts basis. But I know what the business is going to earn on a normalized basis. Year to year, there's tons of volatility. You have to strip out changes in marketable securities. You've got to strip out underwriting profitability, both of which I normalize. Um, so I can get to a, a very rational, very conservative, by the way, measure of profitability. Um, so I, I start with 10. Well, the opportunity set, if I were to, if my only option were to own passively the S and P five hundred, I'm gonna make four to six percent, best case, over the next ten years. You you are priced at levels where margins are at record highs, and if we hit Wall Street's ex expectations for 2022, you'll be 150 basis points of net margin above the prior record. I don't think it'll happen. Um, could happen, but I don't think it'll happen. And you've got very, very high multiples to earnings. You've got high multiples to earnings now for the five big tech stocks that now make up 25% of the S&P 500. For the majority of the last 10 years, 15 years, that group of five stocks, to the extent they were publicly traded, some were not public for the entire 10 or 15 years, they weren't cheap. I mean, they, they, they were not expensive. Apple traded it 12 times. Stripped the cash out of Google and it traded at a teens multiple. Facebook recently was traded at a teens multiple. But they're expensive today. And so when I'm looking at anything new coming in the portfolio, or I'm looking at adding to positions, and most of my activity is trading around the positions that we own. It's trimming things that get dear, adding to things that get a little bit cheaper. On average, I'm only adding two to four names per year 
you know, two and a half, maybe three would be the average per year of new names. And I tend to offset that with a like number of sales. So I've tended to keep the number of stocks in the portfolio at under 30, and I've tended to keep the concentration in the top 10 holdings at roughly three quarters of capital. And there's no method to why I do that. It's just kind of the way the portfolio has evolved over time and how it's always been run. But any security that I own, whether I own it today or whether I'm prospectively thinking about owning it or I'm actively buying it, I'm, I'm not simply saying this is a great business and you can just buy it. Because that, yeah. that's, that's, as we've discussed, I think that's where speculation enters the mix and that's not investing. You what about the idea of never sell? You know, like just not, what about this idea of never sell, right? Just don't sell good businesses. Well, that, that takes you down a whole nother path. Um, and there's, there, there's an entirely separate conversation to be had there. I, I have learned over the years that there are businesses that you ought not sell. I've made the mistake of selling some businesses. Regrettably, my largest mistake I wrote about in my letter two or three years ago was a sale of raw stores. And I, when the market was bifurcated and all those small caps and mid caps were really cheap at the same time the S&P traded at almost 40 times and the NASDAQ at 242 times, I bought Ross for 10 times. They had 350 Ooh. stores. They had a really long runway to open new stores and the unit economics were terrific. But the stock had been crushed, not because the operations of the business were struggling, but because it was a small cap value company. Hmm. You know, f small cap value fund manager was faced with redemptions on a daily basis and would have otherwise loved the portfolio, but had to sell to meet redemptions. I mean, that's what's happening in Kathy's world today. Um, so I paid 10 times for it and earnings were conservatively stated. Made two and a half times my money over the next couple of two and a half years. Market drop, S&P dropped 50%. I made two and a half times my money in Ross and now it's trading north of 20 times and I thought because Chris was really smart <laughs> that he would sell it and you know come back to it well the idiot never came back to it and it's been well above a 20 bagger from the moment that I sold it not from when I bought it but from when I sold it it's mm -hmm. been one of, one of the best performing That's stocks in the stock market for the last 15 20 years and I've got a number of those <clears throat> and so what I've learned to do on that never sell front is I've got, a, I'm in a world where I have to mesh institutional and non-taxable money. And I also have to run taxable money. Yeah. And I run taxable money, I think very well, and I'm very price sensitive. But what I'll do now, Bill, with a company like Nike is I, I want to own Nike for the next 30 years, or I want to own it as a coffee can investor would forever. But I don't want to own it 40 times or 45 times. And so I will trim that back and I'll try to optimize my selling in the non-taxable world. But I'll sell it down in a taxable account if the price is far, far ahead of the fundamentals. So, you know, my Nike holding today is one half of 1%. And I'm not going to sell anymore because... If I sell it, the likelihood that I repeat my experience with Ross and never come back to it is hmm. pretty high. That's so, interesting. You know, I learned. I, 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 I learned like later, that. just a few years ago, I I read that Lou Simpson had ultimately done the same thing. You know, he would keep his what you'd call today fashionably compounders, but you could scale them down in size. And so I scale them down in size for price. Old Chris. Before I started Semper, you know, I managed money for a bank trust company. I managed one of their mutual funds, worked with some big public pension money in the state of Missouri, had some, you know, super accounts. Um, but I didn't know anything in my 20s. I was learning. I was on a very steep learning curve. But I was very wed to fundamental valuation. Price to earnings, price to sales, price to cash flow, price to book, dividend yield. And I didn't spend as much time thinking about business quality because I didn't understand business quality. I just thought if something's trading at eight times, it's going to trade it 15 times eventually because that's the median PE for the stock market and everything ought to trade it 15 times. And, yeah. there's some, and there's some merit to that. And I look at some of the garbage that I owned when I worked at the bank and even in the first couple, three years of running Semper, 
you scratch your head and go, why would I have owned that? I mean, not a great company. So to your point about a Foot Locker, Foot Locker is wed to Nike. And Nike has gone direct to consumer. They're running a lot of business through the app. And that, that that's one of the cases. I, I think it's it's much easier for the the average investor to say it. The multiple is too low and I'm going to get multiple expansion. Well, we've thrived. We being the stock market has thrived on multiple expansion for the last 10 to 12 years. So you're sitting here at, at nosebleed multiples because you've had multiple expansion and, and, and well in advance of fundamental business growth, revenue growth, profit growth. You've had multiple expansion and you've had margin expansion in places. I mean, these five big tech stocks are more profitable today in aggregate than they've ever been. Um, and I don't think there's a lot of room for upside. But a footlocker, because even though they're still wed to Nike, and even though Nike's their biggest supplier, and the lifeblood of footlocker, Nike has to manage that balance, and they can't kill that distribution channel. Um, and so, but they have to they have to marry the, also the notion that, man, our sales through the apps are way more profitable. And so, you know, I was kind of early to baking in a doubling of Nike's net margin, which they're in the midst of. They're halfway there. And the world's now catching on to that. That's why Nike will trade it, you know, 40 to 50 times. It's really not trading it at 40 to 50 times when you get to your your kind of your normal higher margin structure. That That's hard to do. You know, finding the places where margins will durably grow, that's really hard to do. Amazon has been an evolution in that notion um, they didn't make a bunch of money for a bunch of years. And, you know, they've got this core retail business that looks a lot like Costco. It, over the years that I've owned Costco from 2004 to the present, which I have now shrunk back down in size and I've not sold it for my low basis taxable accounts, but I've eliminated it in my, uh, my, my non-taxable accounts. You know, Costco, um, where was I going with that? You may have to edit this. I am happy to do so. Uh, we were talking about um, <clears throat> business quality, never sell, uh, finding margins that are inflecting uh, upwards. And then you were talking about Nike and how you had baked in the doubling of margin and how hard that is to find. <clears throat> and then you said that Amazon... Oh. Didn't make money for a while, but Amazon. it's got a retail business that reminds you of Costco. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I yeah I pivoted to Amazon, then I went to Costco and forgot I was talking about Amazon. Yeah, I'll blame it on the COVID. Um, <laughs> the uh, you know, so Amazon has been clipping along, and they're now running about a six and a half percent after tax margin. Yeah, I think it's more like six two. Um, you got to figure out where it's going to wind up. Costco, over the years that I've owned it, has increased their net margin from 1.8 to 2.4. Some of that has been the lowering of the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21%. But it's also a business that has durably been able to increase its profitability, even though they pass all of their cost savings that they're able to manufacture right through to price and to the customer. They, they, they'll operate at a 1% merchandise margin, which nets out membership fees, which get a little bit nuanced. So Amazon, as you know, the world knows, has created kind of this second great business in AWS. A little bit more of a commodity business, uh, uh, takes some capital. You gotta figure out what the margin structure of AWS is, but Amazon's retail business, you've got the, 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 the first party and then the third party sales. You got to figure out what that margin is going to wind up looking like. Getting to where Nike's margin structure was going to double, kind of backing into what their their online distribution margins look like was a fairly straightforward exercise. You had to tease out a lot of numbers to get there. Um, I think in a best case scenario, Amazon could get to a ten. I don't think you can get any higher. I mean, the core retail business inside Amazon shouldn't look a lot different than Costco. Um, you know, Costco finally has traded just about at 100% of sales. I mean, if you're gonna do a 2% profit margin, capitalize things the way you would, you'd trade at a third of sales. If you're growing and you're earning very high returns on capital, you might trade it at a higher multiple 
And so, you know, Costco can trade at half of sales or 60%, but it's trading at 100% of sales, which means it's trading at over 45 times earnings. And its earnings are no longer as understated as they were when I bought it in 04. When you understand the structure of Costco, and the it takes eight to 10 years, eight years, let's call it, for a new store to be mature. Their typical store has 130,000 members. Well, in the first six months, you don't have 130,000 members. It takes years to get there. It takes years to turn the inventory fully based on a full membership. We're building a new store in St. Louis, they have three. 130,000 members per store. You take the size of the metro area, they're going to cannibalize their other three stores for sure. Hmm. But they have room on the brilliant real estate they select to go do that. And so I bake in same store square square footage growth. If you, if you grow the aggregate square footage of Costco's entire enterprise domestically and internationally, 16, 17 years ago, it was growing at 7.5%. Now it's going to grow at 25 to 3%, 3.5%. Yeah, they, they've only demonstrated an ability, and their business model says we're going to open 20 to 25 stores per year. That was the cadence in 2004. That's the cadence today. So the square footage is not going to grow as fast. They will, I think, of all of the retailers, maintain the ability to grow same store sales annually at at least double the inflation rate. So you combine square footage growth with same store sales growth and a durably increasing bottom line that can you know maybe grow 1% faster than the top line. They don't buy shares back because the shares have never been cheap. They pay special dividends to the shareholders. I paid 29 bucks for the stock initially. And in the interim, they started paying a dividend the first year I bought it and I thought, oh no, does that mean they're not gonna be able to grow? <laughs> as fast as I thought they would. And no, it's just the fact that they're disciplined on the retail front, or on, on the real estate front. But they've also paid a series of four special dividends. Uh, a couple of years after I bought the stock, they paid paid us $7. A couple of years later, they paid five, then they paid seven. And going into last year, not knowing what the Biden tax plan would look like, I said, you watch, but they're gonna pay a big special dividend. Cash continues to build and they paid 10 bucks a share. Ironically, if you add up those four special <clears throat> dividends, it's exactly my cost basis of 29. Well, the hmm. stock's trading at $450 today. Yeah. They're going to earn 10 and change. Um, it's, it's as expensive as it's ever been, and it's not going to grow as fast. And so judiciously, you've got to measure the opportunity cost of what can Costco earn prospectively for me as a shareholder on an annualized basis for, say, the next 10 years. And that company has robbed multiple years worth of underlying growth. And so I, I can scale that back in the portfolio and move capital around now to the energy patch where I'm buying assets at two and three and four times uh, EBITDA. You just saw the news that Shell, uh, which has been shedding assets at a rapid clip, uh, is selling nine and a half billion dollars of Permian Assets to ConocoPhillips, hmm. three and a half times EBITDA. Um, I own a couple of refiners for the first time in my career that I bought in October. They immediately doubled. They have come down now in the last four or five months to where I'm buying them again, but I'm paying prices that are more than 50% above what I paid in October. Why? Because my opportunity cost set is different today than it was in October. So I paid, yeah, that makes sense. I paid one and a half times kind of normalized EBITDA for my refiners. They're trading at a little higher multiple today. But I watched Holly Frontier earlier this year, maybe five, six months ago. Shell, they're European. They're going to decarbonize. You know, the, they, they've got political pressure from the European Union. They've got political pressure inside the countries in which they're domiciled. They are shedding their carbon footprint. And so they sold a refinery to Holly Frontier for, I think it was $300 million. Hmm. One and a half times EBITDA. And when you contemplate the fact that the internal trader inside of Shell is making his own P&L and book and has a motivation to earn his commissions and his profit in the hands of a non-major, non-integrated, 
more independent operator like a Holly, they actually paid about one times EBITDA for that asset. So you don't have to generate that much profitability for that long. And I'll tell you, on the front of public policy that says we're going to go to a zero carbon footprint by 2050 or 2060, even though China is in the midst of doubling their use of coal by a factor of one United States of America use of coal over the next 15 years, which is extraordinary how that worked under Paris. Um, but there's a scarcity of assets. Since 1981, the number of refineries in, in, in the United States, in North America rather, have been cut in half. We've increased the capacity of the refining capacity. And so we were actually you know, allowed, a, a, able to refine more crude through what's half of the number of refineries. But nobody in Europe, nobody in the United States is ever gonna build another refinery. It's not gonna yeah. happen. There's a scarcity to some of these energy assets that are now dirty that nobody wants to touch. But if you presume the population of the world, of Europe, Europe's not gonna grow. But if you assume the population of the world and of the United States is going to grow, and it will, we have about 1.5% penetration of solar and wind and renewables of all power production. To get to 100%, A is an impossibility. The wind doesn't blow 100% of the time. The sun does not shine 100% of the time. It shines its brightest on June 21 in the northern hemisphere. And so when it's down and you've closed natural gas-fired production capacity, as California has done, in fact, they just closed their last nuclear plant, Diablo Canyon, which is absolute insanity, and presume that you can buy power when needed because you're in a heat wave from outside the California grid, well, guess what? Those outside of California are going to tell them to pound sand. You have to have un uninterrupted supply of power, meaning if we're going to add solar and we're going to add wind, you have to add natural gas fired capacity underneath it. You take a unrefined nuclear bulls would say you could use nuclear, but that's got problems. Well, well we need to well, we need to build way more nuclear. I mean, you, you can't get from A to B and do it with with sol solar wind and geothermal. You yeah. have to have nuclear if we're going to decarbonize our energy yeah. production. But you take unrefined crude and you think about all of the refined product that comes out of a barrel of crude, you know, kerosene, propane, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, all the way down to asphalt at, at the thickest, at the bottom. And you think about all of the things that we use that require those various refined product, you want to, I want to have my knee replaced. Guess what? You got to have the plastics. Where do you get yep. the plastics? Enterprise products yeah. one time I checked, crew. but uh, so maybe I'm wrong. We are, we are for a lot of merit and good reason trying to reduce the production of carbon for the environment. And I think that's noble and makes a ton of sense, but you've got to be realistic about the, about the timetable and how you get there. And the fact you will not entirely get away. You want to have solar panels. The only way to create a solar panel, which is effectively a microchip is at very high temperatures. The only way to get that high temperature is burning coal. So you can't go to zero coal. You're going to have to have various of these dirty assets and as the shells of the world are shedding them, you're creating a scarcity. You're creating an imbalance. Public policy is driving the energy market to a tightness kind Cold of Twitter unlike we've ever seen. This. And you, I'm capable seen, of owning those assets. Have you seen cold Twitter? They're going to love this, Chris. You're like, they're, they're, they're going to be super happy. Um, I, I happen to agree with you. There's, I, so I, when I say I happen to agree with you, I, I think what I what is a more precise statement is I have seen a lot of commodity. I've seen a lot of smart people interested in commodities on capital cycle theory and scarcity. And I find it interesting one that uh, these are not people that have not been around the block. Like these are investors, right? They understand what's going on Two. um, 
the when you're talking about rolling out or or reducing a position in Costco and getting interested in energy, it is so counter to the narrative and everything. Forget about narrative. I mean, price and multiples are showing you what narrative is, right? I think those drive narrative as much as the other way around. It, it's so contrarian that I do I just don't know how many people have it in them to do it because it, it's like if you had to go to your clients and say, this is how we underperformed, I don't, I, you got, you've got to have a lot of confidence and you've got to have your clients trust you a lot in order to make that move. And it's a very uncomfortable move to make. So when I think of like one of the max pain trades in the market, uh, what you're describing is one of the max pain trades that I can think of. And those types of high level thoughts get me kind of interested in, in, in um, things. And I've been, I've been digging into different industries. I've got a couple interviews coming out. One's a shipping interview, one's a lumber interview, mostly to, uh, to educate people on how these things actually work. I'm glad I didn't do lumber, you know, when it was mooning and I, I can't be accused of pumping now that it's sort of like crashed. Right. Uh, but it hasn't actually crashed. If you look at where it's settled in, it's quite a bit higher than it used to be. And the question becomes, well, is this a new normal? And I think, I think these are the kind of, um, they're very interesting conversations to have. And, you know, in a world where I think that, uh, most of the conversations that I'm, I'm privy to, and maybe it's just a selection bias, but, um, I feel like a lot of them are going on, you know, just own Costco and never sell it. Um, there are very smart people, very thoughtful people that own it. Uh, so I, I, I accept that there's good reasons, but I also sort of wonder whether or not some a good idea has been taken too far would probably well, be the way, best way that I would say it. Well, you have to, you know, to, to never sell. You're either going to never sell an outstanding business that generates very high returns on capital, or you're never going to sell something that you're betting on the come. Those are two different animals. Yeah. Nike and Costco and Starbucks are totally different animals than Twitter and Shopify. You keep taking shots at Twitter. I got love for Twitter, Chris, but I, I do not well, disagree with your, with your comments. The one thing that I, that I will ask you about, <clears throat> sorry, to give you an opportunity to respond, because there's going to be someone listening to this that says, you know, you keep saying that they're not making any money. There's a lot of growth spend in the P and L. How do you think about normalizing some of these hyper growth businesses? Like when you are thinking about what terminal economics are 10 years out, um, some, some, and I'm not saying Twitter necessarily, I think that there's a different issue there, but some of these hyper growth growing 80%, you know, the way the accounting works is they're not allowed to capitalize some of the, uh, the sales and marketing expenses. They're not allowed to capitalize some of the R and D the the organization is sort of scaled too large in the um, expense base relative to its sales base today, but the sales base should scale over time. Like, how do you think about that? And what would you encourage younger people to, um, you know, get a model or look at historical examples? Or how would you encourage younger people to to think through it or not younger people, me, cause I need help with this stuff. I I'm confused more often than not when I look at a lot of these businesses. Well, the, well, there's a lot there. Um, yeah, there is. Sorry. <laughs> on, on you can give me R a minute answer. That's precise. That'd be great. <laughs> well, on the expensing of R and D that's, that's a, I mean, that's a very great point. I think it's not as, it's not as black and white as some now think it is. Um, you, you can take a non-capital intensive business like, you know, four of the five big tech companies that kind of exclude Amazon from, from, from the other four. Um, R and D to me equates to maintenance CapEx. And so a business that's Guys, capital go intensive away. can overspend or it can underspend on replacement of its capital and when your average ceo is on the job for four and a half years and your motivation is to drive the stock price up there are places where you have material underspending on capital go assets. away i'll go back to the energy patch i've done energy three times bill and it's hard i mean it's very hard to invest in cyclicals 
you, you have to be able to you have to be able to weather the storm. So you're only going to get into your cyclicals when things look bleak. Yeah. And in doing so, so I back way way back when we were starting Semper, I spent a week or two in Houston, about a week and a half, and I was very interested in the deep water drillers. Hmm. They'd just been crushed. Oil was less than ten dollars a barrel on its way to five. The Economist had magazine cover with a straw stuck in the earth, and it was it was as simple as pulling oil out of the ground as it was drinking a milkshake. Hmm. Um, and these guys were in trouble. These new rigs that a Transocean or a Diamond offshore would have built for three hundred million dollars then they weren't in use. You know, some were on five year contracts, but you know when a rig came off contract, they were being cold stacked. They were stacking up in the port of Houston. Um, and so I met with the management teams and everybody. I mean, I was young, but well, those guys wanted to take meetings because their stocks were in the tank and they were just happy to talk to somebody interested in the long side of the case. <laughs> and it, it became quickly obvious that the lesser well-capitalized of the participants in the industry, companies like Rowan, were going to fail within a few weeks or a few months if the downturn in energy persisted and the utilization of their assets remained subpar. And so I wound up owning the better capitalized, the very well capitalized of the two, kind of a chicken yeah, way to play, kind of a very chicken way to play cyclicals, but I didn't want to get taken out on a stretcher. And so I wound up owning, in retrospect, way too little diamond and way too little transocean, both of which tripled, but hmm. they tripled with a insignificant amount of my capital. But I, you know, didn't know it was gonna turn when it turned and I thought three, four or five months I can add to these positions and I never got a chance to add to them because they ran up and I didn't understand as much about opportunity cost. And even though something has doubled in price, but it's going to triple or more from where you bought it, you can still buy it. Um, I think about, I think about the conservatism of accounting. So I wound up, going to lunch with the C the brand new CFO at Diamond Offshore, which is was largely owned by the Tish family and Lowe's. And I asked this mm -hmm. guy, why did you guys just extend the depreciable life of your rigs by five years? That's a red flag. I mean, yeah. when you're taking a fixed capital asset and you're extending the depreciable life, usually that's funny business. So his, his, his answer, and this was a very conservative guy, he was driving a Oldsmobile 88. There was a car, I mean, Oldsmobile is now gone. <laughs> yeah. But there, he was driving an Olds 88 that had like 388,000 miles on it. And it was huh. his work car. He lived way out on a farm. And he yeah, had not a long the type of guy that you would day. think so is like drove super aggressive. his work car and he had some whatever sports car. He swore that he had some nicer car. Um but he was a conservative guy, and he said, look, two things. One, the decision to extend those lives were not mine. They were the prior CFOs. He said, but, Chris, and I, I forget whether they were extending from 20 to 25 years or 25 to 30. But he explained that they believed that these rigs actually had a 40-year life. So you would build a $300 million piece of equipment. Today, that same new piece of equipment with modern technology would be at least double that, so $600 million, But then it was $300 million. So we're going to do a five-year contract with Petrobras. We're going to operate the rig. And at the day rates that we can lock up on a five-year contract, we will have paid for the rig. Hmm. Our break-even, five years. Now, we're going to run it for a factor of 40 years. So it'll come in. And we'll refurbish it and we'll modernize it and we'll send it out for another five-year contract. And so these are great assets. Well, guess what? Here we are, the energy patch gorged on exploration in 2011 and 12, 13, 14. Exxon was spending $40 billion a year. The majors were, were spending like drunken sailors on projects that made no sense. The independents a lot of whom have failed, were likewise spending. 
and there was just a massive amount of overproduction. We drove oil down from 100 down to, well, we're, seven, we're in the 70s today, but you know, we traded last year in the 20s, and for a moment, the front end of the spot curve was negative. That's technicality on a futures roll. But you think about those assets that have now been in a six-year bear market. Utilization mm -hmm. of the modern fleet of deep water rigs is way down. There's a lot of cold stacking that's gone on. When I had lunch with Christian Seam, who runs an engineering construction firm in Norway, they have a fleet of vessels that will take a topside gathering platform that will be owned by a Petrobras or by an ExxonMobil or by an Equinor, which is the old stat oil, and connect everything that happens on the topside all the way down to the wellhead. So all of your risers and flow lines and pipelines, they have pipe lay vessels. Very well capitalized company. Net cash on the balance sheet. Anyhow, Mr. Sam pointed out Look, when you get to about two to three years of stacking an asset, it ain't coming back. Hmm. It, the, the, the cost of bringing it back and putting it back into production are gone. So, the, so, the, so the, the fleet that you're counting as idled is a fraction of what, of what the world is telling you that it is. And so for that, the older equipment, and again, when I was visiting... Transocean and Diamond back in the day, that was the late 90s. That was 98, 99. It was 99, let's say. That brand new shiny piece of equipment with modern tech and global positioning, very high tech equipment, is done. Did not get to 25 years. Did not get to 30 years. It certainly didn't get to 40 years. It's done. So in the, in the world of capital intensity, which the world has gone away from, you better be able to live through the cycle. And so I, I tend to gravitate toward very, very pristine manage, uh, balance sheets and managements that are, that are better capital allocators than others because you've got to live to fight another day. But you've also got to be right on the cycle. I mean, half the world, majority of the world thinks, hey, we're decarbonizing so you can't own a refinery because we're not going to have gasoline-fired cars. We're going to have all EV. There's going to be no use. We're, we are going to 100% wind, solar, geothermal, and maybe some nuclear. But we're not going to have natural gas-fired plants. We're not going to have any coal-fired plants. We're not going to have fuel oil plants in the Northeast. So you got to make your bet as to a rational timeline as to when you get from here to there. And also presume, again, with a growing population, that you cannot eliminate some of these dirty fuel sources. And so that, that's the bet that I've made. But even inside that bed, I'm, I'm trying to find very high quality, lightly or unlevered assets. You know, kind of in the yeah, non-ESG. Go ahead, Bill. No, that, make, that makes sense. I, I was just, I was thinking about like some of these high flying tech companies. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to hear you talk about, I mean, obviously it's a capital asset, right? But it's interesting to hear you talk about um, this high, qua, this high tech piece of equipment that, that was supposed to last for 40 years and is now gone, you know, after 20, I wonder what parallels exist out there among some of the, uh, I, I mean, I think some of the, the valuations and the underlying assumption is these are installed bases and they're just going to last forever and we can cut costs eventually. And the margin structure is going to be 30% net and it's going to be, you know, I mean, some of these businesses are growing at 80%, maybe off small business, uh, small bases. Right. But, if they can do it, just run the numbers on, you know, 10 years out, apply a 30% net margin, and then back back your way back to what today's value would be. I, I think that's how people are doing things in the market. But it's it's interesting to think about which installed bases are going to stick and which ones may not. And that's well, and, ultimately and, where people make money, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, kind of continuing to unpack, I think, your prior question. When, when you ask how I would value these things and how I would do it, it's, it's exactly what we had talked about earlier. I'm just going to, I'm going to presume a very best case, long-term top line growth. I'm going to presume the most favorable margin structure, and I'm going to capitalize it at the most favorable price. And against that, you've got to measure what your return is in a best case scenario. And if it's a mediocre number, you can't touch it because the yeah, price you don't even need high. to do anymore. So you have to back it off. Yeah. I, Bill, I would be, 
a terrible, terrible, terrible venture cap investor. Horrible. It's not the way I'm wired. I'm looking for predictability, or I'm looking for mispriced asset in a cycle. Um, but where I've got a fairly knowable, predictable earning power, stream of earning power, that I can capitalize on a number that makes sense to me. Yeah. And there are nuances to owning non-levered or lightly levered businesses where I've got an enormous advantage where companies have the ability to reinvest capital. I take my broad portfolio and you take, as I do, aggregate all of my holdings as though they're a single business. And I only get 20% of profits coming back to me as a dividend. And so 80% of the profitability of the companies that I own, and you asked earlier about kind of the knowability of a cyclical and trying to get your money out of it, whether you're ever going to get it out. I've got 80% being reinvested. Yeah. And so the advantage I have is, one, my stocks trade at 13 times earnings. I'm trading at half the multiple to book. I'm trading at less than half the multiple to sales. I've actually got a higher dividend yield than the S&P 500, which has a 45% payout rate, which is pretty extraordinary. But I've got 80%. And my job, one of my largest jobs, the most important aspect of my job is measuring how well the CEOs and management teams of the companies that we own, how well they reinvest capital. And I take what's an average kind of 14.5% return on equity to portfolio. You back out Berkshire, which is large holding, and it earns 10 on equity, which that, that tells you that Everything else is earning more than 14.5% by a point or two. But I can go through the list of companies that I own. And these guys have durable places to reinvest. Starbucks can open new stores. Yeah. They, you know, they, they are reinvesting at mid-teens returns on capital. You think about the difference of what the broad market is doing, what the S&P 500 components are doing. They're paying you 45% to get you a 1.7% dividend yield. I mean, the dividend yield was 90 basis points in March 2000, which tells you how crazy expensive everything was then. But we're sitting here with a 45% payout, and that's only getting you 1.7-ish percent, which tells you how expensive stocks are today. With the balance of your 45%, the residual 55% that you're not getting as dividends, that 55% that gets retained guess what it's being reinvested in? It's not opening new stores. It's not reinvesting in R&D and growing the R&D footprint. It's not growing the growth CapEx footprint. It's buying back shares. And those share repurchases are being augmented with debt. And you're paying high 20s to low 30s multiples to earnings. You've been paying north of 20 times for the last decade, which takes you below a 5% earnings yield. There's a capital destruction taking place, which is merely trying to offset the dilution that comes from giving 2% of your company away every year to insiders and trying to still at the same time shrink the share count. Because who wants to see 2% of your market cap being bought each year and have a flat share count? I mean, why are we buying yeah. up all the stock if the number's not going on? So they, they drive it down by about 90 basis points, not even 1% a year. But they're buying 3% of the company. And as prices have gone up, the utility of those larger and larger purchases are buying back smaller and smaller percentages of those companies. To maintain that share purchase cadence is requiring debt. So the capital structure of the companies that comprise the stock market today have never it's been more worse levered. Worse. Leverage, yeah. leverage relative to equity, leverage relative to assets has never been higher. Not so in 1929, cheap, not in the 60s. Not at any time. It's never been higher in corporate America. And I think that's yeah, just, a distinct advantage for somebody would, like us. Something I think is interesting is you would think that that's, that would be a rational outcome given where rates are. Uh, the the thing that I've enjoyed to hear you riff on in the past is uh, we've arguably hit a point where debt is going to aggregate debt will impede growth. So... If you play that forward, in many instances, you've got uh, companies buying in shares at high multiples with arguably slower growth ahead. Uh, could be a recipe for disaster. Um, I, I don't really know. I, I've, I, uh, 
I'm one of these people that I've seen valuations go higher and higher and higher, and I've been wrong the whole time, so I just kind of no longer hold strong opinions, and I, I'm getting a little bit better at saying, you know what, I just don't get it, um, rather than making a call. But um, it's definitely an interesting time, Chris. Well, the, it's, the it's, next ten years will be interesting. They will. They're not going to, and I, I can tell you, they're not going to look like the last ten. Yeah. Even even the even the big five techs can't repeat what they've done. I, 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 if you if you go back to my letter two years ago, I I wrote a, a little thing on the impossibility of repeating ten year performance, and those five tech stocks had a market cap of more than five, call it five and a half trillion dollars, and they had gotten up to just over twenty percent of the S and P five hundred. That group of five stocks is up got to be something like 60 to 70 percent since i wrote that letter a year and a half ago february of 2000 just before covid market cap of the top five stocks today is almost 10 trillion dollars nine to be fair they generate a lot of cash a well, lot of cash yeah they're 25 percent of the s p 500 they are more more than twice as profitable as the residual 495 companies in the S&P 500. Their profit margins are, in aggregate, probably 25%. And unlike the multiples at which they traded conservatively for the prior 10, 15 years, they're, as a group, trading at 30 times. Um, they're very expensive. And the growth curves are slowing. They're universally slowing for all five of the businesses. Apple's mid-single digit growth if you if you linearly run it over the last three four or five years um, they're coming down and I, I don't know what it will take to shake and break the multiples be it regulation be it competition but the law of large numbers takes hold if you take nine and a half trillion let's call it in market cap which is probably what the number is and you run it at 15 percent and you run the S&P 500 at 4% sales growth and assume we're at record profit margins. And so we're not going to expand the profit margin. So net income per share and sales will compound at the same rate of four, which is about a point, about a half a point less than the rate at which the S&P has compounded for the last 10 years. Sales growth, net, in, net income growth per share has been closer to nine and a half. And that's the margin expansion that we've seen. But if you run a 15% total return on those five companies that are now 25% of the market, you're going to get to almost 100% of the market cap. Yeah. If the S&P compounds at four. At 10%, you're going to get to 50, 55%. I mean, it breaks. At a point, it breaks. And I don't know what breaks it. But when, when, but when that breaks... You can't tell me that every one of these new SaaS software stocks are all going to get to the finish line and that they're all going to grow into their valuation. You can't tell me that of all of these recent IPOs that don't make any money yet, everybody says, well, it's Amazon, Amazon. They're all, you know, you've know, you got to give these guys a runway to grow and make money. Some of these things will never make money. I don't know if Uber's ever going to make money. Um, some of these are bad business models, but then some of them are unknowable and some will face their own, you know, some of these disruptors will be disrupted. I just think when you start paying giant multiples to sales and everything's on the com, you're standing at the roulette table. You're, you are, you are, you are not, you are not doing what I do and trying to find noble, predictable earning power and buying it at a reasonable price. I mean, that's a totally different game and some can do it. Some are good at it. You know, I think the I think the the tail when we talk about debt and systemic debt, total credit market debt, government, household, corporate, put it all together, we're beyond four hundred percent total credit market debt to GDP. I thought we were at nutso levels in two thousand when GDP was ten and total credit market debt was twenty five trillion. We were two hundred and fifty percent. That we'd never been higher. Not in World War II were we higher in aggregate. Government debt was higher, but household debt and corporate debt were not. Corporate debt was non-existent coming out of the Depression. 
nobody was making any money. Yeah. We got to 2007 and GDP had grown by 4 trillion from 10 to 14. Debt had doubled 25 trillion to 50 trillion. It took over $6 in debt during that seven year period of the government maintaining low interest rates to grow GDP by $4 trillion. Here we sit today at a 22, let's call it $22.5 trillion economy. We got $88 plus trillion dollars in total credit market debt. And households are in better shape because they were given a mountain of money by the government over the last year and a half. So if you take the extreme of how do you deal with excessive leverage and you look at what's happened throughout history, eventually you get hyperinflation, which is yeah. a crazy thought and something I never thought we'd have to deal with. But if you get hyperinflation, <laughs> then some of the best assets to own are your long duration companies, be they private or public. And maybe the market's getting that right. And maybe Nike should be trading at 40 plus times. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe Apple should be trading at 32 or 33 times because those are good stores of value. Those, those are companies that will sell to you in any economic climate. And they'll durably persist. The best performing stock market in the last couple of years has been the Venezuelan stock market. Well, they're in the middle of hyperinflation, and that's priced in local currency terms. If we have a hyperinflation, it's not going to be the United States alone. It'll be the entire industrialized world resetting its debt. Terrifying thought. I think there's a 10% chance it's underway. And if that's the case, you better own companies as a store of value, or you better own some real estate, you better own some productive farmland, you better own some cattle. I don't know, I, I wouldn't do it with the crypto, but I don't understand the crypto and how there's a permanent store of value there when governments are in trouble uh, and run their monetary policy through the fractional lending system. I don't think there's room for crypto yeah. in that world. And maybe not all crypto, and there's a lot of fraud in crypto, tethers a fraud. There, there are some clear frauds and how much of that are Bitcoin and Ethereum caught up in that? Who knows, man? I don't know. That, that, but that's a whole nother, that's that's a conversation I shouldn't have because I'm not well equipped. Well, I can understand the idea of digital gold, but it is an idea. I, I think the, the interesting thing about um, Bitcoin specifically is I, I, uh, I'm, I'm crypto curious. So I'm not one of these people that says like, oh, I'm not, I think it's stupid. But uh, I do think it's kind of funny that they don't like fiat, but they don't mind putting their faith in a math equation. I mean, it's sort of a fiat of type, right? But it's a belief in math and whatever. I mean, if it works, it works. But uh, it is fundamentally a belief, right? Um, so I can understand why it's in the too hard pile. I'm, I'm with you. I would rather own, own companies. Uh, I, I can get my head around that. And I can stick with that. And that's what really matters. So. Yeah, and you know, if we get to where preservation of capital and purchasing power is what matters, and then that really is all that matters at the end of the day, then if you're going to have extremes <clears throat> of monetary policy, which we've been having, and we're going to fix the debt bubble that we have, the Fed's kind of disarmed itself from the ability to help the economy because its government debt is now 140% of GDP. You've passed the point at which incremental government debt can be stimulative to the economy, can certainly be stimulative to asset prices, which we've seen in the last year. But we're going to go into this taper and we're going to reduce the cadence of buying $120 billion worth of securities per month. Somebody's got to explain to me why the hell they've been buying $40 billion worth of mortgages in the midst of one of the strongest housing markets this country has ever seen. I mean, that's about as misguided, not so policy as you can have. But if we're going to taper this thing, forget about raising rates. I don't think they can raise rates durably, and I don't think they can permanently taper either. We saw that from 2013 to 2018. doesn't work. I mean, you've got an $8.5 trillion Fed balance sheet versus what was $750 billion or $850 billion before the financial crisis in 07. So tapering does not imply that the Fed is going to be selling treasuries and mortgages, but when their current holdings mature, they simply don't roll and replace. And so if our government's going to run a $3 trillion deficit this year, 15% of GDP, having run $3.1 last year, 16% of GDP, 
if we're going to run these gargantuan deficits from here to eternity, which is MMT, then who's going to buy the paper? Because the Treasury is not now running a balanced book. They're borrowing a net $3 trillion a year, whatever it's going to be for 22, $1.5 trillion, $2 trillion. It should be lower, hopefully. It's still a big number. It's still going to be way north of a more prudent 3 or 4% of GDP. Who's going to buy the paper if it's not the Fed? The public markets, the private sector has to buy that paper. Well, what does that do to financial asset prices in the meantime it, for somebody to fill that stopgap? I don't know. There's, there, there's a lot going on. At 400% credit market debt to GDP, we can't have a normal, what, what you and I would think of as a normal term structure of interest rates. You can't get back to 5% on the short end of the curve and 7% on the long end of the curve. Not going to go there because you've got too much debt. The system can't service the debt. Yeah. Somehow these wizards have to reset it and figure out what we're going to do. And I know elected officials and appointed central bankers here and abroad are not going to go down the path of belt tightening and austerity. Well, it's not we, in their self-interest. Pardon? It's not in their self-interest. No. Right? No. Uh, that requires telling hard truths, and uh, that last I checked, politicians don't love that. No, no, they've got constituents; they've got to get themselves reelected, and so you just spend. Um, but but we've spent ourselves into oblivion, and it's a mess. Four hundred percent; it's unfathomable to think we can have almost ninety trillion dollars in on balance sheet liabilities on the front end of the boomers theoretically retiring. Yeah. And we have unfunded liabilities for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, which, depending on how you do the math, are another 40 to $80 trillion. On top of the unbalance sheet leverage that we have of $88 trillion. It's, 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 a, it's a broken system that all of this federal spending is not going to be accretive to GDP. GDP peaked, growth peaked in real population-adjusted terms in 2000, when we got to 250%. Hmm. And we've grown nominal GDP at 3% a year since then. Real GDP per capita, which had grown between 1.5% to 2% for the prior 70, 80 years, is clipping along at less than 1% now and has done so for the last 20 years. And now we just layered on another turn of debt to the system. And that can only be deleterious to top line economic growth, which is functionally translative to top line revenue growth for the S&P 500. So the market's got a lot of this right. Places where you have durable growth, it's priced it accordingly. And these businesses are, are, are appropriately trading at very high multiples, especially in a world of low interest rates. But bear in mind that low interest rates are low because we don't have any growth. And there's yeah. because we have too much debt. And those are both gargantuan problems that we're going to have to deal with at some point. And unfortunately, at 52 years old, we're going to deal with it in my lifetime. Mine too. This is terrifying, Chris. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm regretting having this conversation <laughs> right now. <laughs> I tend but, to uh, I, I, uh, I look forward to having more of them, uh, more of the conversations with you. Um, I got one last question for you before I let you get out of here because I got to go too. But uh, Berkshire's float, I think you and I agree that it's not as overstated as people um, like to cite. I have advocated <clears throat> the idea of some sort of a <clears throat> venture e type bet on long duration assets. Um, I don't know. You know, pay up for pay up for quality businesses maybe is a better way to say it, um, and and recycle the capital on a more ongoing basis. The reason that I've said that is I I thought that March twenty twenty would be Buffett's shot to go elephant hunting, and I'm not sure that uh, the government's going to let him do it anymore. So now, more of like a either buy an index fund or just dollar cost average into great businesses is what I have thought of. What do you think of that idea and why is it dumb? Well, when you say float, I think what you're really just talking about is the cash that sits yeah. on the left side of the, the excess cash I mean, that, that 
accumulates is what, yeah, I'm, float, what I'm actually Float referring. is effectively the insurance net liability. That's right. So I, I it, apologize. It, it, some people equate it to cash, but, you know, Berkshire's got 135 or $140 billion in cash on the balance sheet. I, I've presumed for the last four or five years that maybe only half of that is effectively spendable. You know, the other, call it 65 or $70 billion, resides in the subsidiaries. And it resides as kind of permanent fixed income surrogate in the insurance operations. So between the energy and the utility business or the, between the energy and the rails, they've got about five, you know, $4 billion, let's say. I think the MSR businesses have close to 20. As I go through my year in reconciliation, hmm. and it's taken me a lot of work to get there. Hmm. There's some cash at the holding company. Right now you've got 80 billion in cash in the insurance operations. You've got another... 19 billion dollars of fixed income um, and, and and that's where you start to think about the fixed income and the cash somewhat equating to the float of the business but berkshire's insurance operations are massively overcapitalized and i talked about it on i think i talked about it on yeah the podcast on with Chris's Chris, podcast, so I, won't, yeah. I won't get into it here again but <clears throat> you've got total insurance statutory capital of 230 billion 240 billion they only need a fraction of that to write what they write, the $60 billion in annual premiums that are being written between Geico and uh, the primary businesses, the, the new specialty business, the home state businesses, the med mouth stuff, and then um, obviously the the uh, reinsurance operations between national indemnity and generate massive overcapitalization, which, which allows Berkshire to own $300 billion of common stocks. So you're talking about the cash. Yeah, you, you, you strip out the cash that's kind of going to be held on hand, and Mr. Buffett acknowledged that in this year's annual meeting. I think it's probably seventy, and he said, I think he said sixty or seventy billion dollars is probably more like the permanent number. He had written for years ten billion was the permanent threshold below which we would never take the cash balance. They just doubled that in the very last ten Q to twenty billion. But I think it's structurally across the operation more like seventy. So half the cash, seventy billion, let's say is available for purchase. Putting that in context, Berkshire's total assets, as I mentioned earlier, are over $900 billion. Yeah, it's not For huge. the last 20 years, the cash as a percentage of firm assets has averaged 12 or 13%. So it's on the order of 16% today. It's not that much aberrantly higher. Okay. Operating income, if you, if you ignore the retained earnings of Apple and all of the common stock holdings, the 300 billion in common stock holdings, there's about 10 or $11 billion, call it $11 billion today, that's being retained that Berkshire does not book as cash through yeah. the cash flow statement, but it's profit nonetheless. So, you know, Berkshire's operating profit is 25, um, 25, 27 billion dollars. Uh, last year they bought back almost 25 billion dollars worth of common. First two quarters of this year they've bought back 13, 12, 13, something like that. I mean, you know, they're they're spending 100 percent of what they're making in terms of the the spendable cash. Yeah, they're I don't mind them a, buying their shares. That makes sense to me. I, I just I, don't know how much more you need to let accumulate. That's kind of the well, it's not growing. It, it, in yeah. the last couple of three years, it, the the cash balance really relative to assets has not grown. Um, I think the amount of money being spent in the utility operation, as we discussed, is brilliant. It's a very large sum of money, and because again, that that's not profit that gets distributed to Omaha, but it's retained. That utility operation, which is worth something like sixty billion dollars, maybe seventy billion dollars today, on it's you know four billion as I do the gap adjustments to my profit. It's going to be a way bigger business ten to fifteen years out. If if they continue to build the grid, continue to spend on renewables, continue to appropriately shrink the coal footprint, the utility operation is going to be big, really big. Um, you know, Mr. Buffett talked about Apple and, and the railroad being roughly kind of worth each other. The Union Pacific was valued at $170 billion in the market. It's down to like $130 billion today. Bill, I just, I think if, if, the, if the disposable spendable cash is 70, you are correct. There are no elephants to be had. There's too much competition from private equity. 
all of these spack morons are going to have to find something to buy in the next year. Uh, no deal. You're coming into year two, there's going to be a lot of bids, Chris. There'll be a lot, of, and, there, and there'll be a lot of deals done. There're going to be a lot of happy sellers. That, that yeah. that's for sure. I'm not sure yeah. about the current shareholders who don't really understand the game they're playing. But so you're right, no elephants. Um, I mean, there might know. be one. I'm just saying, I don't know that you can count on it. Right? That's that's the tough part. You know, kind of net net the overall stock market's expensive. You look at some of the recent buys. Well, I'll, I'll, I think all that's taking place is buying what Omaha believes to be durable, predictable earning power at low prices. I mean, that's what they did with Apple. Yeah. So, you know, they buy something like Verizon. That's what they're doing. I think the bet on on Chevron, which has been trimmed back, I think that was an earning power bet. It's you know, you're just buying the drugs is a basket of companies that are trading at a teens multiple. I mean, you know, yeah. Mr. Buffett buys earnings yield, earning power, but there's not a lot more to be had. So I'd love to see the stock cheap. I would love it when people talk about Mr. Buffett's grandson or grand, you know, grand nephew or whoever the, 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 the journalistic world figured out is outperforming Mr. Buffett. I haven't read the article yet, but I love those headlines because they're losing it and, I, I'm the weird investor that when I look at my portfolio and everything's green and has gone up in price, I'm just miserable because I know yeah. I've got cash to invest. I've got dividends to invest. I've got new clients and deposits coming in all the time. And I'd rather have low prices than high. And Berkshire's the same way. I'd rather have a low price. And at some point, they'll get a chance to spend a bunch of that $70 billion. So patience, grasshopper, it'll happen. But it's not, not a big well. number. It's not... It's not harming us by sitting in cash. And I, I assume they'll earn seven on that cash. I really think they're going to earn 10, but I don't assume they're going to earn it right away. So there's some time yeah, value. Some of, drag. There's some yeah. time value of money to that, netted against what they're actually making in T-bills, which today is zero. A couple of years ago, it was 2.5%. So you run that differential. It's And you're talking about you know, what I think can be a potential of $5 billion in earning power added to the system, but I already account for that in my 45 plus billion dollars in profitability. So whether they do a deal or not doesn't doesn't change my appraisal of the company at the moment they do a deal, if that makes sense. Yeah, but it does. You want them to spend the money. So yeah. fortunately, fortunately, the stock's been cheap. I mean, last year's almost $25 billion in repos were done at 105% of book value. That's the hmm. cheapest I've ever bought the stock back in 2000 and again last year. That's a hell of a buy. Yeah. Um, so there's not there's not a lot that's going on on the capital allocation front that I think can be done better. I think they're doing a great job and uh, I do not lose sleep over that half of the 140 billion in cash that's really spendable has not been immediately spent. I'd, I, I think patience is a virtue and we, we all measure performance and quarters and years and um i think of all the places where capital gets allocated i think the lens of um the value of time has always been appropriately measured at berkshire they there's just no sense of urgency to do something because when you do something for the sake of doing something you're going to do something stupid and they don't tend to do a lot that's stupid you could point to a precision cast parts and say well that was stupid well Donegan had rolled up that industry, but I don't think you would have known. Well, you knew that the energy business was already in trouble, and so their turbine business was already flat on its back, but you wouldn't have seen the impact on the airline industry and aircraft manufacturing to the extent we did. But it clearly, there was an overpay. We own Precision prior to Berkshire's acquisition of it. I would not have paid the price that they paid. And it's clear that the business is worth less now than it was at the time of acquisition, which was already overpaid for. But those those sins of commission are few and far between inside Berkshire. They've you know they've bought some mediocre businesses, and some have been disrupted and evolved into mediocre businesses: the newspaper businesses, the World Book stuff like that. There are companies within Marmon that I think they're not very happy with. But in all, all in all, given the resources, given the cash that exists today, and the money coming in from profit, I think they're doing a great job. And um, 
I just think it's all very conservatively done. That that lends to the ability for me to own a whole bunch of it and believe that I can make at least 10% a year out of it. Makes sense to me, sir. And uh, I thank you for sharing your wisdom. And uh, I hope that I add some value back to your life. And I look forward to seeing you soon uh, and drinking some wine together. We're going to be together in three weeks, I believe. Indeed. And, um, I'm in charge of the wine list. Well, I look forward to that.